pressurization, it needs depth and pressure and uh, water and sediment. And that only happened once in Earth history, and that is Genesis in Genesis chapter 6 with the global flood. <coughs> so the question is then, what is truth? Do we uh, try to combine the Bible with the scientific arguments that are put out there these days? Can we do that? I don't think we can. I think there is either a creator or there is not a creator. This world all happened by chance. And to me, that is a preposterous argument. There is no evidence for it anyway, and all the science says that it can't happen that way. The law of of thermodynamics and all sorts of things, even natural selection, one of evolution's pet arguments is going the wrong direction. Natural selection means loss of genetic information, not the gaining of new information. So what is truth, or more importantly, where is truth? We come all the way back to the Bible then, don't we? And. Uh, this will never do. We are finding that uh, so many Christian churches in the Western world in particular are trying to accommodate their theology with scientific information. And uh, the scientific information is uh, owned, if you like, by the big universities who are Darwinian through and through. If you don't uh, proclaim evolutionary theory as proposed in all the textbooks then you're out of the university. Dr. Nella was commanding a thousand dollars a lecture preaching, teaching uh, his uh, stuff on earth science all around the world getting a thousand dollars an hour. As soon as he proclaimed that he believed the Bible that source dried up and he had to become a salesman for Kurong books. Uh, quite a come down. But uh, he said it was good for him because when he was commanding that kind of uh, income and had that kind of respect at the universities, he uh, was telling people what to do. But as a Christian he had to learn to be a servant of others and uh, so working at the Kurong bookshop was uh, good training in that department just uh, getting alongside customers as they came into the shop and uh, even hearing some of their sad stories, their circumstances that they were going through and get alongside them and help them. So uh, we turn to the book of Hebrews because that does not work. If the Bible is right, uh, you can't accommodate uh, Darwinian science. Let's read it together. Well, I'll do the reading, you do the looking. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Can you believe that? Well, I think it's easier to believe than to believe that it all happened all by itself. Quite frankly, it had to have a creator, didn't it? This creator, this Son of God, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, yes, he didn't just create the world and let it run down, but he did something about the problems that arose because of the human action, he made purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That means he's the boss, doesn't it? It means he is king of kings and lord of lords, and we ought to be worshipping him. He became as much superior to angels as the name his inherited is more excellent than theirs. And we are finding, aren't we, those of you who come to my Tuesday night studies that the theme of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is greater than. 
in the first three chapters greater than the angels who are after all merely ministering servants to us who inherit eternal life that's the, the last verse of uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and then he's greater than Moses chapter 3 and 4 chapter 4 perhaps no chapter 3 and then he's greater than the high priestly order of the old covenant he's greater than the new covenant and so that's the theme of the book of Hebrews yeah well we want to uh, study that and look at that a little bit more closely and reminding ourselves that God does speak sometimes we find him very silent don't we when we're hurting when we're needing his assistance in so many ways we find that he isn't speaking in voices that we can hear unless we train ourselves to hear the inner voice the uh, word that he speaks to us in a still small voice in our quiet times in the Bible in our dreams and our visions God still speaks well he spoke long ago through the prophets and the first one that comes to mind apart from Noah of course is Abram A-B-R-A-M later called Abraham uh, two significantly different meanings but Abram the father of many and uh, in chapter 12 Abram received his call to go to go and uh, live somewhere else and in the process God said I'll make you a great nation and the nations of the world will be blessed through you is that true is Israel the blessing of the world is Israel blessing the world I uh, sort of we've been reading through the books of the Old Testament Joan and I at night time for the second time in five years actually and we're getting a clear picture that the prophets were called upon by the kings to decide whether they should go to war or not there's not much evangelism not much blessing the world through the prophets uh, as far as I can see in the books of the kings it's more to do with uh, conquering the evil around the nation of Israel but then wait a minute I uh, looked a little bit more closely particularly as we were reading 2nd Kings the other night and uh, we saw that the prophet Elisha was visiting a, a household in Shunem I think I've got a, a picture here uh, to show you let me see if I can find it yeah there we are Shunem and uh, he was uh, traveling between Shunem and Mount Carmel and, and other places around he kept coming through Shunem and so this lady talked her husband into building a uh, room for him to stay in when he came through so I got the impression and the same story came out as I was reading Samuel Samuel himself seemed to have a circuit ministry and uh, what would he be doing in his circuit ministry he'd be teaching the people in the synagogues was such thing as synagogues back then well wherever they were gathering as people who claimed faith in God they they would be hearing the Word of God from Samuel I don't know that they had much of a Bible back in those days so they relied on the words of the prophets so there was that kind of teaching that kind of evangelism that kind of exhortation to stay on track if you were and then I was reading F.F. F. Bruce the other day as well F.F. F. Bruce was a, a great scholar of a yesteryear an Englishman uh, it was compulsory reading when I was at Bible College when Joan and I were at QBI anyway and uh, he's uh, quite a scholar was quite a scholar and he made the point that what singles Israel out from the nations is that they had Yahweh as their God as opposed to all the pagan gods of the nations around about and some of those pagan gods called for the people to do some rather obnoxious things like burning their 
babies as sacrifices and that kind of thing. That's not the kind of God that the world needs. We need Yahweh. And Israel is there holding forth Yahweh as the one true God. Yahweh, the God who lives, the God who is, and the God, therefore, who gives life. Do you know him? You need to know Yahweh. And uh, Israel uh, points the finger towards the Creator God called Yahweh, the great I Am. And so even if the prophets were uh, encouraging the kings to do their worst, at least to subdue the nations that would otherwise overrun Israel and therefore wipe Israel out, uh, while the prophets were doing that, they were also doing their job of teaching the people, just like I am here, although really I'm not the teacher, Jesus is the teacher in these last days. Read your Bible and find Jesus. Yes, so uh, while uh, the uh, prophets were probably bits of bush chaplains, if you want to use modern terminology, going around uh, talking to anybody who would listen, in these last days there is just one messenger. By the way, let me go back a couple of slides. We were travelling up to Toowoomba for uh, our daughter's in-law's 50th wedding anniversary last Saturday. And in Hatton Vale, as we were driving along, I noticed this sign by the side of the road. One God! Got my attention straight away. One God. Oh, some Christians have got the sign up, have they? Uh, and then underneath they had many messengers. One God, many messengers. And underneath that is small print, Baha'is. Well, that is Baha'ism, isn't it? Uh, they uh, arose in Persia, I believe, and were kicked out because, well, there was only one messenger, of course, in Iran, in Persia. That's Muhammad. Let's face it, if you don't believe in Muhammad, guess what happens to your life if you don't believe in him? So uh, this Baha'u'llah had to, had to leave, had to flee. There are several millions of them around the world, and they're trying to integrate all the religions so that there's world peace through one world religion incorporating everybody. That's why we've uh, also got that uh, uh, cartoon beside it. There's a lot of Christians who are trying to be Baha'is in so many respects. The Church of the Accommodation, let's not uh, go down that track. Let's believe that there is only one way, one truth, and one life. That is Jesus, the uh, last messenger. I'll move forward again because I think that as I conclude, I've just got in the slideshow. I have another one. Maybe it's on the uh, other stick. So let's turn the technology off now and everybody listen carefully as I conclude my message. I'll read these last verses for you. Uh, because there is only one messenger and because there is only one God, one creator, we must pay more close attention to what we have heard. I'm quoting Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, that means because of all that's said in chapter 1 of Hebrews, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift from it. If you don't pay close attention, if you're lazy with your Bible study and your church attendance and uh, your prayer life, you will begin to drift. And the analogy there is, just as it says in the Word, it, the Greek word suggested to me that you're on a river in a leaky boat and you're going with the, with the tide or with the flow. You're drifting. Watch out for the waterfall. I mean, we must pay close attention to what we have heard. We must be diligent in our Bible study, not just think about the lunch, think about uh, the roast in the oven while the preacher is boring us to tears. Let's pay much, close, much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift. And so we come at last to the anchor 
which is in chapter 6, Acts chapter 6 and verse 19. Chapter 6 suggests to us that we ought to be going on from the rudimentary things of the gospel of the Christian life. We must be growing up. We can't stay as babies desiring milk. We need to grow up and get our teeth into the media things of Christianity. And uh, then in uh, verse 19 of chapter 6, it tells us about this hope that is encapsulated in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul. It's here in the pages of this book. It's, oh, it's a big book. I've got 2,000 pages in this one. It's taking us a long time to read it through from Genesis to Revelation. I think it took us a couple of years reading three chapters a night, most nights of the week, last time, and we're up to uh, Second Kings this time through. It's a big book, and there's a lot of stuff that uh, you find, well, seemingly irrelevant at first glance, at first point. But it is good if you find yourself bogged down in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, for instance, Turn quickly to the New Testament and meet Jesus, that last messenger. We must pay close attention to him, lest we drift away from it. I've been at this church for 20-something years now, and if everybody who came to this church back then, in 1997, if they all stayed here, we would be tripling the size, doubling at any rate the size of this building, but people drift away. Some of them transfer away to other places, but some of them, you meet them around town at the shopping centres, and you know jolly well that they aren't going to the Baptists or the United Church. They're not going to church at all. They've drifted away. Well, their end is spoken of in the book of Hebrews 2. Judgment does await. And uh, hence, the hellfire and brimstone sermons of evangelists of a, another era. We don't seem to do that now. We, we talk about God loving us all, God having compassion, and we urge people to come because God is love. But there is also the fear of judgment that awaits those who, um, who do drift away, who are negligent. And so I conclude with just one more verse. And it's in chapter 3, and it's the first verse of that chapter as well. Therefore, there's another therefore. In other words, you've got to lead, uh, read, learn, and inwardly digest chapter 2 and find out what that's saying. And uh, find out why the therefore is there. Holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the Apostle and High Priest of our Confession. Well, that's a little bit light as far as I'm concerned. I don't like the NASB at that point, just for that translation. I looked at the Greek, and it's a kataneo word. Well, I'm not going to ask you to remember that, but the kata is a prefix in Greek, and we get it in catastrophe and cataclysm. In other words, it's a strengthening of what the noun is saying. And the noun is neo. If you've got nous, that means you're using a Greek word. That's the Greek word for the mind, neo. And uh, so we're to exercise our minds. And kata, at the beginning of it, means to strenuously or fully exercise your minds concerning Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So let's look to Jesus rather than to silver or gold. Let's set our hearts on him and we'll sing that as our confession as we conclude just now. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have him than riches untold. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. Amen to that. Oh, it was great at Garden City Baptist last Sunday. It was like I was back home in Kingaroy, old style, 
you know, singing out of the big books. Uh, we sing the Hillsong uh, stuff nowadays, and they're good too, but it was great to have a taste of the old, old song, the Fanny Crosby songs. And I don't think we sang this one, but it was good. 